So I'm Jeff Dyer. I'm the Horace Beasley Professor of Strategy at the Brigham Young University and also an adjunct faculty member at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, I think that um, the biggest changes I've seen um, are around collaboration um, to create new ideas um, and sort of travel and communication uh, changing the way we, we are able to um, see new things, find new things, and be able to connect them to create new ideas. So 30, 40 years ago, people just didn't travel that much or couldn't communicate that easily with others from around the globe. Um, so it was, it was harder to find an idea in Italy like Howard Schultz did when he you know, went to Italy and he went to these espresso bars and started observing and and he saw these, you know, th these drinks that he'd never seen in the U.S. and that tasted so much better. And he thought, I got to take this back to the U.S. Um, and so we see a lot more of that sort of importing ideas. Um, there's a company called Zango that makes this juice called Zango Juice. The founder Joe Morton got the idea when he was over in Malaysia and talking to Malaysians about uh, these fruit products uh, that seem to have all of these health properties. Um, so we, we have it in terms of travel, but we also, in just in terms of communication, you're much more likely to be able to find ideas um, via the, the, the Internet, to connect with people from around the globe to get ideas. And I, I think that uh, uh, innovation today is less sort of an individual aha in their sort of hometown or region or whatever, and it is much more collaborative and much more global um, than it used to be. So um, it's, it's an interesting question because I think corporate entrepreneurs have to innovate around their existing set of resources and capabilities. So it really limits their view of what they can do because if it doesn't fit within the, sco the scope of the company's sort of mission and business, then people say, we don't do that. And they have to, maybe, they have to leave. Uh, if they really want to pursue an idea that they think is, is you know, valuable or, or worth doing. Startup entrepreneurs, on the other hand, have a wider vision. It's not like they have to leverage existing resources and capabilities. They've got to actually try and build them and create them to help sort of execute on the ideas that they might have. So I think the, one of the big differences is corporate entrepreneurs um, tend to try and be more efficient in terms of leveraging what they have so it narrows their view. Startup entrepreneurs have a broader view and they can adapt and change much more quickly and effectively than corporate entrepreneurs who have to sort of stay within the mission. Of course, the, the flip side is the corporate entrepreneurs, they have resources and finances and cash to be able to maybe do things that, you know, that startup entrepreneurs can't do. So in our project, and this is a project I've done with Hal Gregerson and Clayton Christensen, Hal Cr Gregerson, a professor at INSEAD, Clayton Christensen, a professor at the Harvard Business School, which we call the Innovator's DNA and, and is in our book coming out in a couple months. We studied business innovators, and we tried to figure out what skills do they have that the rest of us don't? What distinguishes them? And what we found is that they were great observers um, they were much more likely to be out observing the world. They were much more likely to be networking and trying to talk to diverse people from all sort of walks of life and different backgrounds. Um, they were experimenters. Um, they were much more likely to take things apart, put them back together, sort of try new experiences, launch and test new ideas. And while they were engaged in observing, networking, and experimenting, they were great questioners and, and trying to challenge the status quo. Why are we doing it this way? One of the problems with our education systems is that over the last 20 years, our scores on standardized tests, sort of IQ type of tests, have been going up. But the scores of our young people on creativity tests have actually been going down. So we're getting great at the analytical side and, and expecting that and teaching that. Um, our, our children are learning how to give great answers, but they're not learning how to ask good questions, at least not to the extent that I think they should. So I think part of what we have to start to build into our education systems early on, this is probably junior high, high school, are more classes that teach people to learn through questioning, observing, networking, and experimenting. 
Um, and we have to take that to the college level as well. I think in our MBA programs, our Masters of Business programs, we are pretty much dominated by courses who teach you how to do analysis, right? how to do planning, um, as opposed to the, the issues of how do I creatively solve this problem by going and doing some observations? And what observations would I do? And, or how do, I, how do I network to a variety of diverse people that might help me with solutions to this particular problem I'm facing? Or what sort of little mini experiments could I do in order to test this idea? Um, or how could I take this product or process apart and put it back together to see if I could figure out a new way, a better way to do it? Um, we don't do a lot of that. And we don't teach people how to question very effectively. So I think in terms of having an impact on the, uh, the US economy, it really comes with education um, and changing in our education systems what we expect and what we teach our students. But then also, hopefully, that then helps translate into companies where they learn about how to build innovation capability in their human capital. And then hopefully that will help the companies to also be much more innovative.